Are y'all seeing section two now? Okay, very good. All right, so section two, the science of diving. <clears throat> so don't get too caught up into making this more complicated than it has to be. We're not really gonna try to make the science here complicated. We just want you to understand the basic principles of it. But physics refers to physiology, uh, it refers to physical force. Physiology refers to our body's response to physical force. Like I said, we're not gonna get too far into it, but there's different types of buoyancy that you will be aware of. And the more you dive, the more you're gonna get used to it. But basically Archimedes principles is, is what relates to dive, uh, diving for us. And I just went the wrong way here. Okay. So positively buoyant objects float. The way they float is they displace more water weight than what they weigh and then they float. So when a diver is floating on the surface and has inflated his BC, he's going to float. When he lets all the air out of his BC, his weight is going to cause him to sink down and he's going to be held down by that weight in his BC. And then a neutrally buoyant object is neither floating nor sinking. It's going through the mid water. This is like what a diver is going to be he doing. He's not walking on the bottom. He's not floating on the surface. He's going through the water like a submarine. So air has an actual weight to it. Before I got really into diving, I didn't think of air as having an actual tangible, I can feel it sort of weight to it. Now, I realized that air had some sort of scientific value that a scientist can tell us, but I didn't really realize it was something that you and I can both feel the weight of the air. And one of the easiest ways to feel the weight of the air is with just with, with scuba tanks. A full scuba tank, a scuba tank that's just full of air is going to weigh a real six pounds more than an empty scuba tank. And the only difference is the amount of air in it, but it's six pounds worth of air. So right here, sitting in our homes, in our offices, whatever, we are exposed to what's called one atmosphere of air pressure. It's the, it's the weight of the atmosphere from here to the edge of space pushing down on us. There's a few different ways that we can refer to that, that amount of pressure or that weight. One easy way is to call it an atmosphere of pressure. Another way to refer to that atmosphere of pressure is to call it a bar of pressure, or you can say it's 14.7 PSI. If you go to 33 feet of seawater, the, that first 33 feet of seawater weighs the same as all the air from here to the edge of space. And every additional 33 feet of seawater you go down is going to be another atmosphere of pressure. So the weight of the air from here to the edge of space is actually as heavy as 33 feet of seawater. So this stuff's pretty easy, no two concerns there. You just want to watch, watch your air pressure. The deeper and deeper you go, the more and quicker you're going to consume air. So basically, if you if you run, or you're going to breathe twice as much air every 33 feet you go down. Not that that complicated to think about. A lot of people before they take dive class think they can't ever go scuba diving because <clears throat> because their ears hurt when they swim to the bottom of a swimming pool. And realistically, everybody's ears hurt when they swim to the bottom of a swimming pool until we show you the technique and how to make that not happen. But, but airspace is squeezed. So think of a kickball, basically, just a soft, flexible kickball. When you throw it in the water, it's going to float. When you push it under the water, it's going to start shrinking in from the water pressure. That's because it's got an airspace in it, a flexible airspace. We have an airspace behind our ears. We have an airspace behind our mask lens. We have lots of air spaces going on with our diving. We have to equalize those air spaces. So when we go down, I'm going to teach you a technique to equalize your ears. And what that's doing is that's reinflating the, your eardrum to the size it's used to being. And then it won't cause you any pain or discomfort. Any airspace has to be equalizing that equalize the air behind the lens of your mask. Your lungs are in airspace. You have to breathe continuously to not overpressurize your lungs. 
you have to occasionally exhale into your dive mask to equalize that airspace as well. Occasionally, you can suffer a reverse block. You should never dive with a cold or congestion, but if you ever get a, a block ascending, so when you're going up, if you feel pain in your ears, you've got to go down and deal with it. You can't immediately come up, and this is the technique to relieve that squeeze. So a lot of people think that scuba divers are breathing pure oxygen and they don't and they might even think we're breathing pure oxygen right now but it's really just because they don't know what scuba divers are are breathing or anybody's breathing for that matter right now in the classroom we're breathing air you're breathing air i'm breathing air air is made up of roughly 21 percent oxygen and 79 percent nitrogen our body needs and consumes oxygen. So I breathe in 21% oxygen. I use some of that oxygen up, consume it, and I exhale less oxygen than I breathed in. I breathe in 79% nitrogen and I exhale 79% nitrogen. It's an inert gas that I don't need, I don't consume. It's just sort of a buffer of gas. But the no decompression limits and how long I can stay down underwater are based on that nitrogen gas and that absorption. Scuba diving single important rule is to breathe continuously and never hold your breath. Don't dwell on this rule and don't stress about it. Just keep breathing. Even here in your, in your classroom, in your wherever you are right now, you still have to keep breathing. Just keep breathing underwater. Don't hold your breath. So, Think about this same kickball that we were talking about. If we take this kickball and throw it in the water, it's going to float. If we start pulling it to underwater and we pull it down to 33 feet of seawater, it's going to shrink to exactly half its original size. If we release it at 33 feet of seawater, it's going to fly to the surface and it's going to re-expand back to its original size when it makes it back to the surface. No problems, no issues, nothing at all. That's why you can swim to the bottom of the pool now as a non-scuba diver, hold your breath, go down, come back up, nothing bad happens other than it might have, the pressure might have hurt your ears a little bit. But if we take this kickball down to 33 feet and it's half its original size, and we have an underwater bicycle pump and we pump the air back into that kickball so that the kickball is full at 33 feet of seawater. Now it's full back to original size at, at, while it's at 33 feet. If we release it, it's going to float back up and it's either going to double in size or it's going to rupture on the way up. That's what happens to your lungs if you don't, if you happen to hold your breath but all you have to do to prevent it is to breathe continuously and never hold your breath. So let's see if this video is going to play. This is, we're actually going here next Friday. This is the cavern of Jenny Springs, Florida, and it's bubbles get caught on the roof, the ceiling of the cavern, and it's kind of neat to play with these bubbles. <laughs> Now, if students go to this Florida Springs trip with us, they, you don't have to go into this cavern. It's kind of cool, though. The water is very clear. All right, so this is a video of a diver in, I believe this is Bonaire, and you can see them. I'm much, this is me filming this, and this is one of my customers. 
and I'm exhaling and they're kind of playing with the bubbles and catching with the bubbles and it's just neat to see the bubbles underwater. I just like bubbles. The water's so clear here, you can still see the clouds and things, and I'm probably 50 feet underwater, and they're probably maybe 20 feet in the wa underwater. So we wear dive computers, carry dive computers during every dive so that we can plan our dive and know how deep we are, how much air we've got, how long we can stay down. If you happen to stay down longer than you're supposed to, your dive computer is going to tell you what you need to do to come up. If you stay down too long and come up and the bubbles come out and cause problems, that's decompression sickness, and that's the bad stuff that could potentially happen. We're going to give it just a minute for Anna to reconnect. I see she's been disconnected. So, yeah, I, I can't quite hear you, but try. Oh, I'm sorry, but um, oh, so you're saying we're going next week? No, I'm going next week. Y'all aren't going next week. So I'm going uh, this this Thursday. I'm going to Florida, but y'all aren't quite ready. Anna's actually ready. She could go to Florida if she wants to. But we got to get you through the pool and some other stuff and some class before then. Oh, I, that just seemed a little strange, so I wanted to ask. Just no, yeah, no problem. Yeah, some another class is going to Florida with me Thursday. Okay. Good question, though. So, this is going to be a dive uh, video. If it works, showing you about dive computers, it actually may not work. Let's see. Yeah, I think it is. This is the dive computer that I use just to give you an idea of what it looks like and how it works underwater. This tells me how long I can stay down, how deep I am, kind of all the important details my computer gives me. This is a really nice, easy to use computer. So one of the things that we should do at the end of every dive is a safety stop. At least if it's deeper than 15 or 20 feet, you should do a safety stop. And the way I do this is at the end of every dive at 15 feet, I stop and just wait for three to five minutes. Our lungs are our bubble filters. And so our blood is circling the bubbles that we've absorbed from the dive, dive through our bloodstream, through our lungs. Our lungs catch those bubbles and then we exhale them out. What we do with this safety stop is we're waiting and keeping the bubbles small by the depth of the water. We keep them small, give our blood a chance to cycle through our system so we can exhale them out. Avoiding sawtooth profiles. What that means is you don't want to do a lot of ups and downs during your dive. Generally, we do the deepest part of the di the deepest dive at the. We need to check on that. Excuse me for just one second, guys. Okay. All right. Um. So you don't want to do a lot of ups and downs. You want to do the deepest dive of your day at the beginning of the day. And then every subsequent dive is less depth, deep, but not like you don't. It's fine to go to like 60 and 40 and 45, but you don't want to do 60 and 10 and down to 80 and up to 20. You want to kind of go deep and gradually work your way up. Also, for the last, you don't want to fly or drive to altitude for 24 hours after diving. So generally the last day of a, like a trip or something, if we're flying, we just do sightseeing with that stuff.
Guys, give me just a minute. Y'all take like a five minute break. I'll be right back, okay? Okay, guys, I'm back. Sorry about that. So don't fly or drive to altitude for 24 hours after diving. Usually on a dive trip, if we're flying, the last day is just a sightseeing day. We don't dive that day. So you can read here some of the signs and symptoms of decompression sickness. Decompression sickness is pretty rare. If you always follow the rules, you'll probably never even hear anybody that has experienced decompression sickness. But you want to have your own dive computer. You want to know how to work it. And you want to understand what it's telling you when it tells you to do things and not do things so that you can keep yourself safe from decompression sickness. One thing I do try to do and recommend new divers do is just a little bit, take a pain inventory before you go diving. So just because you have some pain and some things after a dive, it might not be decompression sickness and it's probably not. It could just be you're not used to walking up all the steps of the dive boat and carrying the dive tanks and the dive gear around and all that. And so you might be hurting from that just a little bit. Now, there's two different things we've been talking about. Decompression sickness is when you've gone deep and you've either stayed too long or come up too quickly. Another thing to concern yourself with is nitrogen narcosis. This is what Jacques Cousteau called rapture of the deep or the martini effect. The deeper and deeper you go, the, the nitrogen in your, the gas you breathe can become narcotic. As new divers, your limit of depth is going to be 60 feet. And the reason for that 60 feet of depth is to keep you inside the limits of where you shouldn't experience nitrogen narcosis. Nitrogen narcosis can feel sort of like drugs and alcohol. Some of the same effects, you know, euphoria, poor, poor judgment, you know, all this kind of stuff. But it's not like alcohol in the sense that it takes a long time to get out of your system. As soon as you go above a depth that it doesn't affect you anymore, it immediately goes away. So contaminated air carries with it the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning, 
do not use ARIF as a color, odor, or taste. This would be coming from a malfunctioning compressor. I take really good care of my air. Okay. All right, guys. So, what? So, all of y'all are working on the assignments. It's working for you. We're going to call this a short night. I think I had you scheduled till eight o'clock. Okay. Do you have any questions at all for me so far? Do we continue at our own pace for the dive um, or for the SDI <laughs> stuff? Not for the dives. Don't continue. I mean, not well, the diving. That's what I, mean. I know. I'm just being silly. Um, you can you can go ahead and continue at your pace. By next week, try to at least get through chapter seven done, okay? Of the online assignments. That sounds good. All right, perfect. And, and let's does this next... same time and stuff next week work? Sounds good to me. Uh, could you say same. that? Next Monday at seven work for everybody. One second. Okay. So far, it's good for me. Okay. Anna's next Monday at seven work for you. Oops, didn't take myself off of mute. Yes, it does. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Guys, thank you for your attention. We're going to next week will be a little longer chapter. It's the equipment chapter. We're going to go into much. I didn't want to hit it tonight because it's a bigger chapter and I want to cover it really well. So, but we got this one done quickly and we'll have a good class next week. Okay. That's going to be interesting. I think. Yeah, that's, that's when it starts getting fun too. And when we get you to the water as well, but perfect guys, I will see y'all the same time next week. Okay. Call me if you have any questions. Okay. All right, thanks. Bye. All righty. Good night.